Hey, reader. I'm Cindy Burnett. Welcome to my award-winning podcast, Thoughts from a Page, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. On the show, I chat with authors whose books I have enjoyed about their new releases, and I give you a peek behind the curtain of the publishing industry with my behind-the-scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. If you're looking for a community of readers, bonus content, and a chance to read books before they hit the shelves, I hope you'll consider joining my Patreon group, which is filled with a wonderful bunch of book lovers. The link to join is in the show notes. Today, I'm chatting with Robin Oliveira about A Wild and Heavenly Place. The second I saw this cover, I knew I had to read the book. It is just stunning. And the inside is every bit as good as the outside. I am always all about a strong sense of place. And Robin creates such a beautifully crafted sense of place of both Glasgow, Scotland, and Seattle and the surrounding area in Washington state. She is the New York Times bestselling author of My Name is Mary Sutter, I Always Loved You, and Winter Sisters. She received an MFA in writing from Vermont College of Fine Arts and is a former registered nurse specializing in critical care. She lives near Seattle, Washington. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks, AG1, for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Robin. How are you today? I'm quite well. How are you? I am well as well, and I'm really looking forward to talking with you about A Wild and Heavenly Place. Thank you. Such a beautiful book, beautiful inside and out. That cover is just stunning. And then I loved everything inside as well. Oh, I'm so grateful. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. And they did a gorgeous job on that cover. I mean, they really did. And we can talk about that in a little bit. Sure. So as we get started, would you just give me a quick synopsis of A Wild and Heavenly Place? A Wild and Heavenly Place is a continent-spanning epic love story that ranges from 19th century Scotland where my ancestors are from, to the Pacific Northwest, which is my adopted home. I say that this is an unapologetically romantic book. Uh, While writing it, I kept Judi Dench's quote as Queen Elizabeth uh, in the movie Shakespeare in Love sort of on sticky note on the edge of my computer. Uh, And the question that she asks of Shakespeare is, can a play show us the very truth and nature of love? So I kept that in a corner. Uh, I have two uh, main characters. One is Samuel Fittis, a 17-year-old young man who uh, cares for his five-year-old sister in impoverished Glasgow after they have fled a notorious orphanage. And the other is Haley McIntyre, the daughter of a wealthy coal mining engineer who lives in Glasgow's Upper Crest West End. And they meet one day when Samuel heroically saves Haley's younger brother from a runaway carriage. And in that instant, everything changes. And the rest is history, right? (laughs) (laughs) Almost literally. (laughs) Well, how did you decide to write this story? It sounds like you set out to write an epic love story, but the setting and the characters, how did all of that come to you? That was my goal. I did have, I wanted to write one of those stories I loved as a kid, a big, great, big love story that set historically set in place that I loved where it was going to come from, where these people were going to come from and where they would end up is a function of my love of place. I am without a doubt a creature of place. I have lived in the same home for 31 years. I have written my previous three novels. Two of them are based in Albany where I grew up. 
and the second novel is set in Paris, uh, which is a place that I absolutely adore. So it was easy to try to think, well, now I need to include these other places that I love. And I wanted to explore Scotland. I had never been. So that gave me a lovely research trip to Scotland. And the Pacific Northwest has been my adopted home for, I want to say, four decades. And I absolutely adore it. So that was how I found where I was going to put these characters. And then the characters themselves, you know, they just appear sometimes. (laughs) You're thinking, thinking, thinking about uh, who could be living in this story you're hoping to create. And I just start writing and they show up. I have so many questions. So I'm going to start sorting through them. First, I love books with a strong sense of place. And that was one of the things that really resonated with me about your book was both Glasgow and then Seattle and the other areas, Newcastle, that you write about in Washington. I felt like you transported me there. It sounds like you are very fond of place and home and things like that as well. Is that something that you really have to work on? Or as you're writing, does it just happen for you to create these vividly described places? I would say that I'm a I'm a visual writer. I do see the landscape in front of me. I do I do want to describe it. My goal is to transport readers back in time to these places so that they can feel as if I have plopped them right down in the middle of it. That said, I'm I am meticulous about always going to the place uh, that I am writing about even if I have been there you know, a hundred times, say like the San Juan Islands, I've probably been there 40 times in my life, maybe more. And uh, while writing the book, I went back and I took a look at all the places that I wanted to write about. I sat there, I smelled the smells and I felt the wind. And uh, that is essential to me. I can't sometimes, so particularly in the uh, pandemic, I couldn't go somewhere, but Luckily, my trip to Scotland happened just before the pandemic. And so I could not have written that book off of uh, Google Street Maps. I had to go stand on the river, the the river keys there on the uh, Glasgow on the Clyde River there. I had to travel all through Scotland. I had to go all through Scotland, but also all through Glasgow. I had to walk on those cobblestone streets. That just gives me all the sense memory that I need to write from. And I do believe that it's that sense memory that gives you that lush narrative description that, as I said, helps transport you back in time. I think that's exactly right. We love to travel. It's one of my favorite things to do. And I always say to the kids, there's such a difference in looking at pictures of Paris and walking through the streets of Paris or looking at pictures of Seattle and walking through the streets of Seattle. Because you can look at Google Maps and you can see what's happening, but it's totally different than boots on the ground in that place. The smells, how narrow or wide the streets are, cobblestone, as you mentioned, whatever it is, all of that is not going to really come through unless you're literally in that place. And part of it's even practical. What can you see from the point that you're describing in the novel? Exactly. That's absolutely impossible to get from... Well, it's a very handy application. Google Maps is very handy, but I try very hard to use it as little as possible. I think that's a very valid point. And I just learned so much about the history of Seattle. I'm not sure. I love Seattle now. We have visited. It was so much fun, but I'm not sure I wouldn't have wanted to live there back then. (laughs) I was like, hmm. (laughs) Uh, You and me both, I think. (laughs) As much as I, you know, superhero wise, my superhero thing, aside from being able to make world peace is just to be able to travel back in time. And uh, Seattle was a bit of a mess early on, probably for 40 years. And the infrastructure was being done. It was uh, the streets were muddy and full of uh, just litter and refuse and horse manure. And there was a big swamp next to town called Tide Flat. Uh, there were just tumble down houses and some nicer houses. There was a university, but there was not anything that anybody could call manicured, I'll say. And so the struggle of living there was also, you know, how do you get your water? How do you, how do you find food? How do you deal with weather disasters? All of that. It, it was a tough place to be. It certainly seemed like it. 
And I agree with you on the superhero. I don't know what you want to call it. Power, I guess. Their superhero power of traveling back in time. But what I'd like to do is travel back in time, but be invisible. So I can just see what they're all doing, but I don't have to actually exist in most of these spaces because it just doesn't seem like it would be very easy a lot of the time. I know. I think I think we're really spoiled. I too would like to go back and be a fly on the wall. I have to say that I, I, you know, going to the dentist at that time, I'm not particularly interested in doing. I'm also not interested in riding by horseback all over the place or over the rutted roads or any of that. I guess I wouldn't mind the horseback part, but just just the day in, day out, and nobody's bathing very often and just all of that stuff. I'm like air conditioning. So I'm, yes, we are spoiled. I agree. <laughs> well, you said you set out to write a love story. So tell me a little bit about creating your characters. I loved Samuel. Did you have an inspiration for him? Uh, several inspirations. Physically, I stole one of my best friend's sons. He's just a very handsome young man. And I described him and I, I thought, okay, that's my Samuel. But when it came to his actions and who he was, I drew on all the best young men I've known, not only through my life, but through, you know, watching my kids with their friends, who, how people acted, who somebody could trust. I wanted him to be an incredibly trustworthy, loyal man, full of deep integrity. And luckily enough, I have been able to draw from some very fine men that I've known uh, throughout my life. I'm almost 70. And so I have a rich trove of people to look back on and think about uh, who enchanted me when I was younger and who is enchanting whom now that I watch the younger set. That's so interesting because I was just curious because I just loved him. Such a loyal, honest, wonderful individual. Yeah, I think probably the the characteristic that I like most in a human being is kindness. And he has that in spades and he has it having come from a very difficult background and having encountered a lot of uh, problems uh, in the orphanage. And he is committed to that with everybody that he meets. That is so true. So in addition to a love story, you tackle family and how complicated those relationships can be. Why did you want to explore that? I was very interested. I have done this a couple of times in novels where blood family is not always the family that one is able to end up with. So in the Civil War book, my first novel, you know, people died and they had to re-knit themselves. When you go out into the world, you make friends with lots of people and they become your family. And in this particular novel, these are situations of duress. Both characters are under duress from their circumstances with losing family. And I wanted to explore the sense of loyalty that comes from being in a family and to uh, imbue these characters with that, a great deal of integrity around family, even as things fall apart. In particular for Haley, it goes up to her parents and uh, with her little brother and with Samuel, who has lost his parents when he was 10, his uh, little sister, who's only five, for whom he is responsible in a very precarious situation. And I think that dynamic is very interesting. And, it, you know, the two characters mirror one another as they try to make family out of the situations that they're in, maintain their family out of difficult situations. I just thought that was very interesting. It is very interesting. And as you mentioned, Haley really encounters a lot of challenges. Things change for her family. No spoilers. But one of her relationships was really fraught. And it made me think over and over again, what would I do in that situation? I hope I wouldn't handle it that way. Was it difficult to write those situations? It was very difficult to write. First of all, when you have someone who's behaving badly in a novel, you always have to, as an author, figure out why they're doing that. And I had to run through a whole psychological profile in my mind to justify uh, this particular person's action. And I had to figure out why Haley would do the things that she did, why Haley would stay in that situation. And it was complicated by that sense of loyalty to family. It was complicated by her responsibilities toward her family. It was complicated by the fact that she now had a new family and that she was dependent. I often write 19th century glass ceilings for women. And it's always been that women rise above it. My other characters have risen above it. But when it comes to Haley, 
she is in trouble with her circumstances. It's very hard for her to overcome them because she is in a 19th century situation where that glass ceiling is unshatterable for a very long time. And that was, that was, that was tough to write because as a 21st century woman, I think, well, just leave. Right. But in her situation, <laughs> she wasn't able to. And that was really hard. And I agree with you. As I was reading it, I was like, Haley, like you just want to shake her and be like, come on. But you really do have to realize like you're writing a book set in a completely different time. And the options we have now, she didn't. And so that is an important thing, I think, to keep in mind when you are reading in the past, writing in the past. And I appreciated that you portrayed it the way it would have played out versus, you know, initially saying, OK, she could just leave and move on. She could do whatever she wants, but she couldn't do whatever she wants. Exactly. Yeah. Which is different from how we see them now. And it is really hard. It's often very hard to let those situations play out from a 21st century perspective, but it makes for conflict in a novel. Exactly. I know I was like, oh, I think I know where this is going and I really hope it doesn't, but it worked out in the end. And I was like, okay, it's all right. But I just felt for Haley for a while and I wanted to shake her a little bit too. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so you focus on shipbuilding and coal mining. Those were things that were big industries in Seattle and the surrounding area during that time period. Tell me a little bit more about that. So Seattle is a beautiful place and lots of natural resources. And they had this idea, the first settlers, that they were going to be New York by and by. They were going to be the great uh, city on the West Coast. And in order to do that, they had to work with, with the natural resources. One, of course, was timber. You know, they were cutting down forests left and right. The surprising one was coal mining, that there were coals uh, in, the, in the hills out from Seattle, about 15 miles away from Seattle, on the mountain where I live now. And they brought that coal back to Seattle and shipped it south to San Francisco. And that is kind of forgotten history. I love writing forgotten history. Most people in Seattle, except for a few, don't recall that aspect of our history, which is something I like to highlight, forgotten history. And then the other, the shipbuilding, there was a wonderful connection there. When I learned that in the 19th century, they were building steamers in 1879 on the beaches of Elliott Bay in Seattle, it was an easy connection to Glasgow because in at that time, they built these very large ships on the River Clyde. And it uh, there was a term called Clyde Built. And if you had a boat that was Clyde Built, it was the best ship in the world. That was a wonderful connection for me for Samuel as a character. I, I like to sort of think about what's happening in the time period uh, that I'm writing and use that as much as possible for characters to work through to illuminate the story of Seattle, etc. Did you find similarities in the two settings, Glasgow and Seattle? No, mostly differences. Glasgow was very built up at the time. I mean, the, I work with old photographs a lot and the images of 19th century Glasgow Aside from the tenements, it was a very sort of a divided city, the wealthy and the poor on the East End. But there were huge stone buildings and lots of industry and a, a large population. And Seattle was made out of wood and the streets were dirt and the industries were nascent and everything was being built from, uh, from the ground up and often very poorly. I can't think of a connection between them. Did you find one? Not really. I was just curious when you have two very distinct settings, because yes, exactly what you described is what you portrayed. But if there was anything that connected them up for you after you spent a good amount of time in both. Well, I, th there is one connection. I have to say that a lot of Scots came to Seattle and it was educated Scots. So engineers came from Edinburgh. So there was that wonderful connection. And there were a lot of Scottish and Welsh miners that came to Newcastle, one of the settings in the novel. And so when the characters come from Scotland, they hear Scots around them. There are Scots that they can connect with. So there was a, a bit of an immigrant path for Scots into Seattle. Mostly they went to Australia and Canada. 
but I was very happy to find that some landed in Seattle. It would have been so nice to have a familiar face and really a familiar accent. I think that is still true today. You know, you go absolutely expats. You know, they're all together uh, finding one another in different countries. I think that's exactly right. You've got questions. We've got answers. Business leadership, ownership, and sales can be challenging. Tune into the Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast to learn from the world's experts. Join me, your host, Diane Helbig, as I chat with people who have expertise in various areas of business. You'll enjoy the lively conversations that are focused on providing you with the ideas, tips, and suggestions you need to realize greater success. Get what you need for your business when you need it from the people who have the answers. Accelerate Your Business Growth is part of the Evergreen Podcast Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Science! 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 science. Hello, podcast fans. Want to get weird with us? Come check out the Mad Scientist Podcast. We are a weekly show that looks at the history, philosophy, and hard facts behind your biggest paranormal questions. Did the government really pay for a psychic spy program? Yes! Is it true that surgery got its start in grave robbing? Yes! Can a roller coaster really kill you? Legally, we can't say so for sure, but sometimes, yes! Woo! Join myself, Chris Cogswell, and my co-host, Marie Mayhew, as we examine the science, philosophy, and history behind the strange and unusual. All to discover what's possible and plausible versus what's, well, just made up. Check us out wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The Mad Scientist Podcast. We'll talk more about your research because clearly with the shipbuilding and the coal mining and all of that, you must have had to do some research. Uh, I, for every novel, I do a great deal of research and, and this one was uh, no different. As I mentioned, I went to Scotland, traveled around, went to the River Caves, went to the, the ship basins, uh, walked the streets. Then I do often do a lot of I want to say primary research. So I look at census records so I can understand who lived where and when. I look at Sanborn insurance maps for the United States, these wonderful old insurance maps that tell you exactly where buildings were, what their addresses were. I used images from the National Library of Scotland for old maps of Glasgow so I could describe the street names and uh, the setting correctly. I write, I use archived newspapers. Uh, the British newspaper archives uh, were a wonderful resource for uh, reading about Glasgow and old newspapers from Seattle, back then the Seattle, Seattle Daily Intelligencer. I look at city directories, uh, which are wonderful resources. They're kind of like old phone books. They tell you where people lived and they tell you what businesses were being run at the time. When it comes to scholarly things, there are Chinese, uh, there's a Chinese population in this novel. I didn't quite understand what their situation was, so I ended up going down uh, into academic articles on JSTOR to try to understand what historians have deduced from all their primary research into what the race factor was in Seattle at the time. Um, I also use old photographs a great deal. Thomas Annan has a, he was a 19th century photographer in Glasgow, and he took some extraordinary pictures of the closes of old Glasgow where the poor lived before they were demolished so that we can see all of that and understand what poverty was like. And, you know, right in about 1870 in the United States, photography was becoming more widespread. So there were a lot of street scenes that I could use and waterfront scenes for Seattle. I, let's see, I tromped around the mountain a lot where I live with a guy named Mike Infelkoffer from the Newcastle Historical Society. And, and he educated me a great deal about where the tunnels were in the mountain where I live, where the old entrances were, how the old town was set up, where the houses were. And then um, shipbuilding, my husband and I just happened to decide to become boaters at that time. So we were building a boat with a young shipbuilder. Some of his conversation, our conversations with him are actually lifted verbatim and put in the novel. And then we had to learn how to boat. So I ended up learning how to plot a course, drive a boat, and I was able to feel the water. 
in a way that I would not have done if I hadn't done all of that. So that's a lot of it. I also met with a geologist in Seattle, a wonderful fellow named David R. Williams, who wrote a great book about Seattle called Too High and Too Steep, and he understands the infrastructure of Seattle better than ever. There's more, but that's what I can think of off the top of my head. Oh, my goodness. It must have taken quite some time. And how cool to build a boat yourself. It was very enjoyable to watch the process happen. I didn't do any of it, but (laughs) I did get to watch the process. And it, it made me understand the structure of boats so that when I had to talk about shipbuilding and do the research into how wooden boats are built, I was able to at least have a basis of an understanding when I start to look at old videos of boat builders and things. And dimensions and just discussing all of it, what those conversations would have looked like. Yes, I couldn't have written this novel without having built a boat and uh, being out on the water. I can see that. Well, who was the easiest to write and who was the hardest? Uh, Samuel was pretty much the easiest to write. Uh, as I said, he's he's many of the young men I've known are reflected in him and His intentions, I was always very clear about what his intentions were. Uh, That makes it very easy to write. And the hardest person to write, I have two answers to this. The hardest person to write was James uh, Murray, essentially the man who causes so much trouble in the novel, mostly because I think it's always hard to write villains because you have to understand why they're doing what they're doing. And when they're behaving badly, it's just hard to think that somebody could behave that badly when you yourself would never behave that way. Um, But the other one that I want to mention is uh, is a minor character named Press Loving. And the hardest thing about him was giving up all that I had written about him. He had a much larger subplot. And I had to strip that out uh, because there were just too many words in the novel. And he was easy to write and then hard to write because I had to encapsulate his story in a few in fewer words pare him down a bit i did yes Uh can you use that later for another book well my husband laughs at me he says i wrote three books in one and that i have two other novels in the original manuscript that i sent to my editor and i actually think he's right (laughs) so you could just keep writing about some of these people and the places yes yes okay good well i look forward to that (laughs) well what was the highlight of writing the book the highlight was trying to write a love story that that hung together in a way that was traditional but untraditional. I enjoy a good challenge and trying to make some of those scenes where the lovers are together but being torn apart was a great challenge to get the beats just right. Desire, clashing desires, that was that was really a highlight because it was hard to do. So I I think that was the highlight. Well, it's so funny because about a week ago, somebody reached out to me and asked me for some epic love story suggestions. And I had a couple, but I realized I don't know that I read that many epic love stories. So then I finished your book the other day and I immediately messaged her. I have one for you. It comes out in February. (laughs) I'm delighted. (laughs) So I thought it's just funny. You know, somebody asked you that. I'm thinking, well, I've got a couple here, but that's just not often what I'm reading. But then I finished this one and I loved it. And I was like, oh, I actually found a very good one. You you hit all the beats correctly. Well, I'm delighted. It's a bit of an old fashioned book, but I had that in mind. And that was part of my goal as I was writing it. Well, and based on the setting, I think it should be. Well, in the past. Yes, the setting, the time and the place. I mean, Mm -hmm. yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk more about your beautiful, beautiful cover and the title. Well, the title, I always have trouble with titles. My working titles never make it to the final, to be the final title. And my agent has now named two of my novels, and this is one that she named. And it is pulled from a phrase in the book and becomes a repeating theme of the book. And she just very, uh, in a very seer, a very (laughs) hypnotic way, just one day said to me, what about a wild and heavenly place? And it, and it was just perfect. I loved it. And the cover, it was really wonderful. The editors worked with me very closely on this. I, you know, it's one of those things, you just wait for that cover to arrive and you hope it's everything that you hoped for, but you're never quite sure it's going to be. When I opened this one, I gasped because it was everything I hoped for. 
that cover is a composite of photographs that I sent them of the Pacific Northwest from the shores of San Juan Island, which is a setting in the novel, and from the middle of the sound of a picture of Mount Rainier, which is our glorious, now dormant volcano that sort of presides over the city of Seattle. And they put together that cover in such a glorious way that I, I truly did gasp when I saw it. I was beyond delighted. It's so stunning. And that's fascinating. That is a composite of photos you sent them. Yeah, I think it really touched the flavor of what I was after in the novel. And they mix it up a bit. You know, it's not verbatim, but that is definitely Mount Rainier back there. <laughs> That was one of the interesting things to me when I was in Seattle is that you can just be walking around the city and all of a sudden there it pokes out. You know, it's just kind of funny because it's so large and all of a sudden there it is. The mountain is out, we say. It isn't always out. Yes, exactly. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. Yes. Well, Robin, before we wrap up, what have you read recently that you really loved? Well, I, I wanted to share a number of books. The first one is called The General and Julia by John Clinch. It is historical fiction about General Grant, who wrote his memoirs before he died so that he could save his family from financial ruin. It is an extraordinary book. It's one of the best books I have ever read, let alone just recently. So that one, I just think, is um, worth everybody's attention. So I'm going to leap in here because I know all of my listeners are like, Cindy is dying. Because that was one of my top reads of last year. I thought it was just extraordinary. And I literally have been telling every single person I know, you must read this book. And then I've also been telling them all these general and President Grant facts. People are like, oh, my God, what's happening? (laughs) I'm like, this book is amazing. And I just learned so much about him that I didn't know. It was, you know, what was really interesting to me was there was there was a persistent rumor about General Grant that he was a big drinker and set out part of the war because he was such a drunk. And John Clinch discovered that that wasn't true. And I hope that that particular fact is corrected in his novel. But there, there, wasn't a, there isn't a wrong word in that book. It's just beautiful. And it's got another great cover. And just everything that happened to him, and I didn't know the Samuel Clemens tie, and that he's who published the memoirs, and all of it was just phenomenal. And my daughter goes to school in New York City, and we had recently walked by the the mausoleum, but it was closed at the time. And then I read the book like a month later and I'm like, now I need to get back and go in the mausoleum because after reading all this stuff and becoming this huge Ulysses S. Grant fan, I'm like, okay, I must go back. And, and I now understand his connection to the city because I didn't. There's a huge housing project very close to her. That's the General Grant Homes and then the mausoleum. And I was like, why is all this Grant stuff here in New York City? And now I know. Yeah, it's extraordinary. And the pictures of uh, Grant's funeral, how crowded the streets were as his as his wagon, the wagon carrying his coffin went through the city. It's just a spectacle to behold. Absolutely. So I didn't mean to leap in, but I literally love that book so much. And I know my regular listeners are like, Cindy's here dying because she can't wait to say, I love that book too. It's a wonderful book. Uh, there's also a wonderful, I'm going to stick with historical fiction. And this is not, uh, this wasn't published recently, but it's The Voyage of the Narwhal by Andrea Barrett. And it is the story of a ship that goes to the North Pole on an exploratory expedition and it gets caught in the ice. It is a wonderful novel. Andrea Barrett is an extraordinary writer. It's a, one of the most lyrical books I've ever read. And I turn to it a lot. I don't even know that one. So I'm going to have to add that one to my list because I don't know it at all. You're, gonna, you're going to really enjoy it. I want to say it's probably 20 years old. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then the last one is, is a book by a smaller press by a woman named Adrienne Harun, H-A-R-U-N. And the book is called On the Way to the End of the World. And it was published just this last year. And Adrienne Harun discovered this incredible fact that JFK, uh, when he was president as part of his fitness thing, challenged people to walk 50 miles in one day. And then all over the United States, these walking expeditions joined up and people walked through the night to do these 50 miles. What is so interesting is that Adrian imbues a certain uh, group in a small town on the Washington Peninsula 
and you have everybody's story about why they've joined and what they're after in the story. It's beautifully written. It's a wonderful book. Oh, that sounds fascinating. And that's another one I'm not familiar with. I'm going to have to add both of those to my list. Yeah, it's good. And then if, if, uh, if just quickly, I'm, I'm very fond of the Poldark series for anybody who hasn't read those by Winston Graham. That gives you 12 novels to read and you'll never <laughs> want to stop. I love series. So anytime I can find a series that is really engaging, that has a few titles in it, I love working my way through them. Have you never, have you never read Poldark? I haven't. I hate to even admit that. I've read a million series because I worked at a mystery bookstore for a while, mm -hmm. but I have not read Poldark. Oh, it's really, if you like historical fiction, it's really excellent. I like historical fiction as long as it's not set too far in the past. Well, this is the early 1800s. No, I can do that. I don't like the 1500s and things like that. I don't like to go back that far. Yeah, neither do I. I agree. So, well, good. Well, now I have a whole lot of books to add to my list, including a 12-book series. <laughs> I'm going to be busy reading. <laughs> Well, Robin, thank you. I just adore chatting with you. Your book is phenomenal, and I can't wait for it to make its way out into the world. Oh, thank you, Cindy. This was a real joy. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I'm Allison Holland, host of the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Equipped with a microphone and a long-term fascination of the Kennedy family, I am joined by an incredible cast of experts, friends, and guests to take you on a fun, relaxed, yet informative journey through history and pop culture. From book references to fashion to philanthropy to our modern expectations of the presidency itself, you'll see that there is so much more to Kennedy than just JFK or conspiracy theories. Join me for the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Hi there, I'm Heather Drago. And I'm Sarah Saunders. We host the podcast, That's a Hard No, about saying no and setting boundaries. So you can become that true and empowered you that this world needs. Saying no isn't just okay. It's the key to living an authentic, fulfilling life. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. So while this podcast is in no way a replacement for one-on-one -on -one therapy, I suppose I know what I'm talking about. I'd say so. We talk about learning to say no and set healthy boundaries and how it impacts mental health, physical health, relationships, parenthood, and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website, hardknowpodcast.com. We're here to help you find your no and say it unapologetically. That's a hard no. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I would love to connect with you on Instagram or Facebook, where you can find me at Thoughts From a Page. If you enjoy this show, please consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. If you have a moment to rate the show or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts, I would really appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And please tell all of your friends about Thoughts from a Page. Word of mouth does wonders to help the show grow. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. You've got questions, we've got answers. Business leadership, ownership, and sales can be challenging. Tune into the Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast to learn from the world's experts. Join me, your host, Diane Helbig, as I chat with people who have expertise in various areas of business. You'll enjoy the lively conversations that are focused on providing you with the ideas, tips, and suggestions you need to realize greater success. Get what you need for your business when you need it from the people who have the answers. Accelerate Your Business Growth is part of the Evergreen Podcast Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because... The news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily.